Hello, Steve. Hi, how are you doing? Thanks Good. for having me. Thanks. Thanks for allowing me to interview you. So today I'm talking to a very famous video game player, actually. Um, the one who did one of those world records in the game Donkey Kong, and this is Steve Weewee. So let me first ask you, um, from what I know, you are, as, as a day job, you are a teacher, right? Correct. Yes, right. I'm a high school math teacher. Ah. So how yeah. did it actually happen that you, you came into video games and why Donkey Kong especially? Yeah, this, that goes back to when I was probably 12 years old, um, when the whole uh, video game craze came out. I was one of the first video game addicts probably out there. And Donkey Kong was, one, you know, before Donkey Kong there was Pac-Man, which was the game I loved to play. Then once I found out about Donkey Kong in probably 1982, it had already come out, and I, I wasn't playing it right in 81 when it came out, but, it, you know, a little bit later I ended up finding this game that everyone was talking about. And I played it, and the first couple times, of course, I was horrible, but I got hooked on it, and ended up this that became my my main game that I played. It took over uh, the Pac-Man game that I was all, already playing before then, so that became my game. And I never got to the kill screen in the early 80s, but uh, when I went to college, and after I had forgot about video games, a, a guy in a, a fraternity had um, a Donkey Kong machine, and I kind of got reacquainted with Donkey Kong and ended up buying my own Donkey Kong and took that into my fraternity room and started playing it hours on end and got to eventually this kill screen. Um, so that's, it all went back to my youth, back to the uh, early 80s, and that just became the, my favorite game. Great. Which year was that, that you came back to Donkey Kong? Yeah, that was probably 1989, maybe 1990. And then I, when I graduated from college, I took it to my parents' house, and I was living there for a, a little bit before I got a job. And that's where I actually got to the kill screen. I was probably 1991, and I didn't know anything about a kill screen. There was nothing, uh, no word of that on the internet that hadn't really come into play yet. The internet was kind of in its infancy if it, if it was around at all at that point. Um, so yeah, that, you, you more concentrated on mailboxes back then and stuff. Yeah, so I ended up selling the machine. After I got to the kill screen one time, I thought there was some something wrong with my game. So I got there again, I got there a second time, and the same thing happened where Mario just was going along okay, and all of a sudden he just died. I thought there might have been some invisible barrels, like a new difficulty level, like know where to jump and when to jump, but I couldn't figure out, you know, just, I had a couple lives on that screen and tried a couple different things and still died, so then I sold it thinking that there's no point in playing this. And I was close to a million then. I think I had 967,000 in that second game I got to the kill screen. And I was thinking of trying, you know, a million would have been a great score to get to, but I was like, I don't think I can get there if I'm going to die on this screen every time. So I sold it. And then years later, I guess it would have been about 10 years since I sold it, I just decided to look up what um, the scores in Donkey Kong are the high scores because I thought, well, if I got to this level that can get past, or that must must be in the top, you know, few scores of all time. And then you know, I looked it up, and Billy had a score, uh, Billy Mitchell, if, of the uh, eight hundred seventy nine thousand or whatever, somewhere in that ballpark. And I go, well, I, I got that back in ninety one, so. I just decided I'll buy a, another machine, and I thought I could do it relatively quickly because it's just like learn uh, when you ride a bicycle, you you know you haven't ridden a bike forever, but you don't 
forget how to ride a bike. You just jump on the bike, and that's the way it was with Donkey Kong. So in a couple of weeks, I got got a higher high score, and and then that's when all the controversy that you saw in the King of Kong happened. So that's a lot of another whole story that I had to dive into, of course, all documented in the film. So actually, you used your knowledge in math as a math teacher to learn how the algorithm of the game works and how you can work around that and make a higher score? A little bit, yeah. The the patterns that you recognize, um, I didn't write any equations or anything, but you could see some patterns develop during the gameplay. When Mario moved towards the ladder, you could tell the barrels were down that ladder that he was moving towards, so you use that to your advantage. And the elevator screen, when you're at the top, there's a certain spring to, to leave on. It's geometry where uh, if you leave on a certain spring, you can get a uh, faster jump, which means that you'll be up the ladder higher when the next spring arrives. So those are the kinds of things that um, the math that you would that I used in in the video game. It wasn't high level math, but just patterns and a little geometry. Well, we have to take into account that back then you didn't have much memory, so you didn't have something like um, like artificial intelligence or something like you have nowadays in games. So things had to be pretty yeah. basic, you know. So yeah, exactly. Yep. And you used that limitation as an advantage um to work around the game that's pretty amazing um yeah mm -hmm. so so how did you decide to go with that um strategy from what i saw in the movie the king of kong that was released in 2007 that um billy mitchell actually used a totally different strategy to to um to finish the game you know like he uses the hammer and and you don't or something I think it's a totally different gameplay. Yeah, well, um, when we first were playing it back in the 80s, the idea was survival, so we wouldn't grab any hammers, only a couple that were grabbed um, that five. But um, actually, I do grab the same hammer Billy does on the barrel level. Um, when I was figuring out how to get a million points, a little bit of math went into that as well. Like when you buy, grab a hammer, you lose time on the bonus. But I recognize that if you could funnel the barrel down the bottom ladder where you're, the level of your hammer, then you could easily surpass that those missed points on bonus and make up for it with the hammered barrel. So that's the key to getting a million was um, getting the bottom hammer. So we both did the bottom hammer. Uh, he did a little bit different technique getting the bottom hammer versus what I do, but this, the end result is the bottom hammer is we, what we both get on the on the barrel board. Hmm. And um, well, you mentioned it earlier that it was like like having learned how to ride a bike, so it was you you thought it would be easy to to learn again and train again. Um, actually, in the movie, it was like you trained for weeks, like hours a day. Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah. Well, it was easy to just get the score that um, was above what was being done in the 80s because of it was just getting past the levels without point pressing. But once the high scores became where you need to do a lot of point pressing is where you you know, grab the bottom hammer or figure out different ways of getting points or you hit the kill screen. So you end up putting yourself in more danger than you otherwise would. So once we, we uh, elevated the gameplay where you're having the point press harder and harder, that's where the, the, where it requires more practice and, and, you know, just learning new tricks. And that's where a lot of the time, commitment had, had had come in at that point but initially it was just getting the first high score didn't require much much time because it was just a matter of getting to the kill screen see 
And um, well, how do you actually prepare for a new high score record? I mean, it sounds a bit like an athletic thing, like uh, like a runner, except that you are not a runner, but a video game player. So you also have to, to be me mentally fit and well, yeah. not lose concentration. Because I know when I'm playing a game after an hour or two or even three hours, that I lose a bit of attention, you know, I, I'm getting less concentrated, mm -hmm. where, where I'm doing personally mistakes. So how do you train as, as a pro gamer to not, to not fall into those problems? Yeah, that's a good question. Well, basically, um, I guess I have a, a good capacity for endurance on those games and keeping my focus. Um, it was just coming from have it since the game's a couple hours i was used to playing two hours but then sometimes if i got near the near the end and then played another game that would be up to two hours so my endurance as i kept going for world records usually you you play at least two or three games in a row and as you play more and more for a longer period of time your your endurance and your focus you're able to stretch your your uh, the amount of time you can focus for over longer periods of time, and at the at these Kong offs, I'm able to I could sit there for eight hours and keep playing, and I don't I don't lose focus. I think I get more determined as I'm playing, and you're getting warmed up. The more you play, you get in a groove, at least I do, and then that is kind of what takes over. You get, you're just determined to to get the high four. And then you just kind of lose track of time. Wow. Well, that must be very frustrating if you are so close and then you lose just before, a little bit before the high score or before the kill screen. That must be very frustrating then. Yes, it is. And it's, I think, a couple, the last bullet, there's, um, since Hank Chen's had the record, there's been another player that's broke his record and I think he had a game or two that he was right near Hank's score and that is it is frustrating because you don't know am I ever gonna how long is it gonna be until I get to this point where I have a chance to, to get that record because you never know if it's gonna be another month it could be a, the next game you play it could be another game where everything falls into place so it is frustrating to get close but you just have to realize you're, you're gonna Hmm. And um, well, if I remember back the 80s and 90s, it was more like you were a geek when you played video games and it was something like a waste of time. And I think this focused, I mean, this point of view changed a bit because it's such a big industry now. Um, so how, how is it for your surroundings, actually, you know? You you must be a hero for your for your students for your pupils that you that that you teach right? They're playing the ones that I'm not used to playing. You know the first person shooter games, but um, they respect you know something that the games that that I grew up with and and um, I show them the movie during the school year and they, and they get they enjoy it. They get all excited and they kind of root for me during the film and. And yeah, I use that kind of as a little bit of, uh, as a hook to get their attention and to, you know, kind of um, win them over. As a, you gotta use anything you can to, to help these students think you're a cool teacher. <laughs> <laughs> so you actually use that um, kind of fame to your advantage in your teaching life. Correct, yeah. Ah, great, great. And, um, well, so you, you got into touch with Twin Galaxies and actually with the awareness that somebody has a high score and that you are pretty close to it, thanks to the internet, actually. Oh, yeah. That's where I heard about Twin, uh, Twin Galaxies when I, some, sometime in the late 90s, must have been like 1999 or something, um, I just typed in Donkey Kong World Record Score and and then the Twin Galaxies website popped up. So I don't know what year it first came up and was active online, but when I ever looked for that score after, I never could find anything out about the scores. Yeah. 
But then once I learned about it, then I thought, hey, this is something. I didn't know that there was going to be any any controversy or that many people cared that much about a high score, but I thought it would be cool to get the high score on something. Great. When I was in a period, yeah. Um, so what is not really much mentioned in the movie, um, because it's basically focusing on your battle with Billy Mitchell for the high score, uh, how is your opinion about um, Walter Day, actually, who, who took care about that all? How did you, how did you deal with him? What's your experience oh, with Walter Day? Yeah, Walter was always very kind to me, and um, I think he was in a position where, you know, had, having he was in in the um, circle where Billy and and all the gamers from the '80s were, and because they had a uh, circuit where about five of those across the United States in some van or some bus and go to arcades and compete. So Walter um, kind of had these, these. now they were men, but he uh, knew Billy when he was 17, 18 years old. And so they go back a long way. So it was kind of difficult when I came along and there was people that were the old school, uh, old gamers were kind of questioning whether I did this legitimately or not. So Walter kind of had to respect what they were saying and he, he had he did respect what I was trying to do so he was in a tough position and but he was always kind and never accused me but um but I always got along from the first time I met him we were we were friends so I, and we still communicate and when we see each other we say hello and talk and we always see you know we know we're going to run into each other every now and then at these events so it's it's always good to to come back and, and see Walter. Yeah, great. Well, yes, I can imagine it's kind of a catch-22 situation for Walter, being between the new guy and the old res um, respected uh, pro gamers. Um, well, so um, in in the end, in the end, um, what's your opinion about about gamers who? actually play games for a living you know like e-gaming is is that something yeah. you 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 really think it's it's cool or do you think that's too geeky i think it's cool if you can make money it's something you love to do and and there's people that are willing to to pay you these prize monies in these tournaments i guess that's more for the new games not the classic arcade games so um i'm stuck having to work for a living, so to speak, but if, if you can play in these games where there's m big money and you can make a living doing it, that, that's all, that's good. All, I'm all for that. As long as you enjoy what you're doing and you're making a nice living and you have fun, I don't think it's geeky at all. <laughs> <laughs> that's good. Well, actually, it's interesting because once I had an, I had an interview with Alexei Petritnov, the creator of Tetris, which is also a very old game, you know, and actually yeah. he re-released last summer a new version of tetris for professional e-gaming for those people so there oh, are really? sometimes cool. yeah so there are sometimes old school games being re-released especially for um competitive gaming for gamers yeah yeah that's, that's cool yeah I don't, um so I, I didn't play a lot of tetris when it came out but i i can see how that's kind of a universal game like with the with the uh, app app games that are out there nowadays that kind of fits into one of those games that you could play on your phone really easy you know I, I think there's probably a phone version of tetris out there i don't i don't know I'm, i bet oh, yes. there is there is there yeah. is <laughs> um, yep. so what's actually your your opinion about this um emulating I know that Twin Galaxies has separated scores for emulated gaming and for real arcade machines. But what's your point of view about emulating? I mean, in the end, the problem will be that in the future there will be no more real machines because they die, they die out after a while. Yeah, um, I think there will always be a way of... Somewhere there's going to be a uh, hardware. You can always in the future rebuild the hardware i guess but yeah i guess someday there won't be 
original board that has all the original circuitry on it. So, yeah, I guess one day there probably, you know, I, I would think there would always be a, a cabinet version. You know, there's still old Model T cars that are running around there, you know, like the old first um, combustible engine cars that are being refurbished. So I imagine there will always be a cabinet Donkey Kong version. Um, but I think, the yeah, the emulated score slowly start to be the, the scoreboard more populated as as these upright versions are more scarce. But I think there is a little difference in the, you know, the play itself is theoretically the same, but you could ask, you know, there's minor timing and nothing that you can really see, um, you know, you witness by playing it. You wouldn't really notice any timing things. So I think if you're able to to get a high score on an emulator, you should be able to do it on the original upright Donkey Kong. The one thing that is different is the controls and being, you know, using your fingertips on a, a cursor is a little different than having to throw a physical, um, you know, joystick around. So it, it does, there are, there's a couple of players I know that, you know, can, can transition. I know they, they've worked at it, but they, they prefer, you know, they, they started playing the game on the, emulated version with the keyboard and that the keyboard interface that I'm um, using the joystick is a little, it's enough of a difference where they, they can't quite master it like they did with the emulated version. So I think they, uh, they need to separate it for now, but as time goes on, maybe one day, you know, the emulated version will be more of, of what the high score board is going to be more populated with. So I think there there will always be a distinction. Ah, that makes quite sense. Yeah, I mean, if you see that um, smartphones are are and they have like uh, virtual joysticks on the touch screen and stuff, that's yeah. also another beast. Uh, <laughs> um, well, speaking about versions, in the movie it was mentioned that you were accused of maybe buying a slightly modified version of the game. So can you tell me a bit about that? Yes. Um, so I first bought a Donkey Kong Jr. machine, and I was interested in going for the world record on that, and I think I got that score first. And then once I did that, I wanted you know get to go and get the regular Donkey Kong score, and I didn't have room in my garage for a, another cabinet or didn't want to spend the money that would, you know, to buy a whole other machine. So I looked up something that was called a double Donkey Kong, and it basically plays both Donkey Kong and Donkey Kong Jr. on the same board. It's a double board, and you just switch between the two games by pressing the player one and player two buttons at the same time. And I was emailed the, the designer of the game, and told him or asked him, is there any difference in the gameplay? Because I was interested in going for a world record. I knew that if it was a difference in the gameplay that I, you know, it wouldn't be a valid board to, to go for a record on. And he said the only difference is outside of the gameplay where, you know, he had the right code to switch between the two games. But once you're in the game, it plays exactly the same as the other Mario and uh, walking and, and climbing up ladders is the sound of Junior walking and climbing up vines. So it's a little higher pitch. So you can notice the sound difference, and that's what ultimately people noticed. And I wasn't trying to pull any fast ones. I looked into it, and I was told there was no difference. And I was just going with what I thought would be okay. And it did initially get recognized and then somebody another referee noticed that there was a difference in sound and they were aware of a double hockey song board and and once that got recognized then they had to investigate whether this board plays the same and they had discussions and yeah i agree that there's they don't they shouldn't have any 
double Donkey Kong boards to keep the purity of of the world record score on Donkey Kong. And once I learned that, you know, this isn't uh, something that's valid for Donkey Kong, I went and got an, a regular individual original Donkey Kong board and, and got the record on that. So I wasn't trying to cheat or anything and just, I was new to the, the scene and I wasn't aware of all the, 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 the details that, that were necessary to comply with the, records ah i see so you thought there might be a problem so you asking at once if it's the same game yeah so basically it's it's um well we should mention here that arcade cabinets you can actually exchange the boards so i guess this double board is just like two rom sets one for donkey kong and one for donkey kong junior but they they kept the sound rom identical so they wouldn't have to mirror all all data from the game because i guess they figured like well it doesn't matter how it sounds and most people will not not if uh, will not notice the, the the little pitch difference anyway so i guess that's kind of yeah awesome. that might have been it or maybe it wasn't possible i don't know if it was possible to get the original sounds because of the hardware the sounds might be more hardware dependent versus the software of it all, but um, for whatever reason, yeah, the the sounds were junior, and um, yeah, so I don't know why or why not. So in the end, you had to play it all again and under su surveillance of Walter Day. So he watched you while you played it. And I got nine hundred and eighty-five thousand, I think it was, at Fun Spot. So I at least showed I could play and. That wasn't, um, I think that was a world record for at least a, a day or so. But then if you saw the movie, you see that Billy had a tape that was higher. But so, yeah, playing in person was a lot more gratifying, too. I hadn't had a chance to play in front of a crowd that, like that at Fun Spot. So it was fun to have a crowd, be, you know, I could feel the their excitement. There were still my critics out there. But I think once I went out there and did what I did, I won a few people over. Not everybody. There's still some people that had doubts about me and were upset still at me. But it was fun to to, to meet the people that I talked to over the phone, Walter, and I, I didn't get to meet Billy there, of course. But there was a few other gamers that I had heard about and got the chance to meet. So I had a good experience. So now you are fully in the cycle of of famous people and stuff. Yeah. And well, so did you actually also focus on other games besides Donkey Kong and Donkey Kong Jr.? Well, those were the two that I was most most interested in and I was best at. So I that was my main attention. I didn't really have any desire to go for the Donkey Kong 3. It wasn't similar enough in gameplay where it, I was interested. There was a game Popeye that you're, you know, going around a screen, climbing, jumping. I don't think you'd necessarily jump in Popeye, but you do uh, have a like a same, like a but one single button and a joystick. So I, I was interested in going for the Popeye record, but um, I never got around to it because the Donkey Kong um, battle heated up. You know, I would, I would get a high score and then. Pretty soon there was uh, Billy coming back with a score, or Hank Chen, who later arrived after uh, came out. There was a few people that um, uh, you know watched the movie and became interested in the, the high score. So once there was several competitors, I couldn't. I, every time I wanted to think about going for a, a different game to world record, I you know I, I found out that I needed to keep staying with Donkey Kong if I wanted to have a chance of being the champion. Yeah, you, you mentioned um, Shen coming after the movie and other people. So can, can you tell me a bit about that? I mean, are you still trying to run records or what happened after the movie? Yeah, um, well, I've been going at it, I would say, for since 1990, you know, well, going back to 1991. 
I was playing for a few years then, but just in the last probably 20 years, I've been playing the game. So, and I was, that was before I had kids and, you know, I did have kids when I was going for the world record in the, during the Donkey Kong film, but now my, you know, I've, I've got priorities a little different than what I had back, back during the days of the chasing the record. So my time isn't as free and I, you know, and the motivation isn't quite as what it was when it was, when it was a new adventure, it was more, it was a very exciting to, to try to keep getting these higher scores and getting a million was a big goal of everybody who was Billy and myself and other people that knew about the game, knew that a million was a, a big pinnacle. So getting that was rewarding part of the whole uh, endeavor. Um, and then recently just, I'll just play at Kong off events. I still have fun with the co competition, but, um, going for the world record at this point is, isn't, uh, on my top of my list. And that's what it has to be. If you really want to get the record, you got to have it be like number one priority because it does take a lot of time to play at the level you need to, to get the high score. If you just can't casually play a game, get lucky and hit it. Mm -hmm. But chances are you, if, if you don't play every day for six hours, you're not going to get it. So, and, and it's, sometimes can take up to a month oh, every day, yeah. every day playing and having bad games and bad luck. And then you just got to get through that. And then eventually you believe that you're going to get that game, but that's a lot of time. And to do that now is, is I don't really have it again, motivationally or time wise. I don't have it, but I still like play and, and, you know, do, I put my best foot forward and I prepare just, you know, not as much as I would if if I was going for a, a serious world record, but I do prepare enough so that I have a, a good outing, and that's important that I, I want to look good. And I do have a chance that, you know, you never know. Whenever you step up to a, a game play, it could be the game where everything works out in your favor. You have a lot of good luck, good fortune. And so I, at least I give myself a chance that if, if I do have some good fortune, for the most part, I just, look forward to meeting the, the players and the people that come out who are fans of the movie and, and seeing the Walter and, and just enjoying the camaraderie. So that's the number one kind of drawing, drawing towards the game now, but you never know one day I maybe get possessed and <laughs> want to go back and recapture the, the high score. I, ne I never rule anything out, but at this point it's, it's not in. It's not at the top of my list of yeah, things to accomplish. Not for the moment. Not for the moment. So, so how it how it was after the movie was out? Were you like a celebrity? Everybody knew you. You were like, everybody knew who you are. So, did you feel kind of famous? Yeah, a little bit. I I have a few people when I was out in public, the people that who seen the film, and they would recognize me. So it was, it was kind of strange, you know, to have people come up to you and, but everyone was really kind and it was very cool to, to know there was people that, that were fans of the film and who, who liked the story. And then of course I had some opportunities to go to, to, um, Hollywood and, or some other locations where they were filming TV shows or movies, um, because of the, success of King of Kong, I was able to, to do a little bit of uh, cameo appearances in some films that Seth Gordon directed. He was the director of the King of Kong. Yeah, well, I also saw you were involved in a bit of a PR um, for the Wreck-It Ralph that was released a few years ago. And Walt Disney actually released the game as, as an as a ROM and you could stick it into your into your arcade machine if you if you burned the the ROM data on the ships. Yeah, oh fix it Felix Jr. Yeah, I was able to get a chance to play it when they were promoting the movie. It, I went out to the local um promotion that they had in Seattle and I played you know it 
on it for, you know, a few games. And, and then there was another promotion thing that had me and Billy playing of a head to head. It wasn't live. It was just kind of a thing that I had a, a scorekeeper in Seattle and he had somebody in Florida that was kind of tracking his scores. But the idea was to hopefully have it on video, but it, it didn't work out that way. But, um, I think it's a cool throwback game. It has the elements that the feel of the old classics, simplicity, the graphics kind of reminiscent of that time period. And they, and they, um, the art, the, the machine, they have it look at, look exactly like one of the cabinets. So I think that's a, that was a good, um, good, good movie plot to kind of bring back the art, the, the classic culture and kind of integrate it in with some of the new games that, have been in the, you know, in the public eye with, because they did introduce in the movie Wreck-It Ralph, they had a, a, like a first person shooter type game. And so it kind of, kind of meshed all the video game cultures into one movie. And it was, I think that was a good move by oh, Disney to do that. Oh yes. Well, I, I love the, I love the, um, the part where, where, where the, where, um, the, the Ralph said, "Hey, here some cherries from Pac-Man." <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah, <laughs> that was quite yeah. fun. Or like when Felix said, "Oh, I'm sorry, my Q Burgish is not as good anymore." <laughs> yeah, that that was quite think, fun. Yeah, that was a good movie. I think they're coming up with a, another sequel that they couldn't. Uh, well, I think it was a lot of money for that cop you know, for the to, to get to the permission to use it. So I don't. Um, that's why I didn't see Mario appear. I think there is plans for Mario to be in the set in the sequel, though. Oh, there is a sequel planned. I believe so. I thought I heard something. I, I, maybe I'm making it up, but I believe I heard something about a sequel for Wreck It Ralph. Oh, I should probably Google it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Double and, check my facts. Yeah. <laughs> and you would you would probably promote it again and have a play and get your opinion. Yeah. Ah, see. So you yeah, are definitely. still very much in touch with all the gamer stuff. Um, with other gamers? Yes. With, oh, with, yeah, uh, I don't really talk. Yeah, I don't talk with them except for when we go to these events, these Kong off events. But, um, you know, I, I get an email from Walter every once in a while just to see if I'm, you know, he has these trading cards that he that he promotes. Usually are back in Iowa. I can't make them, but he'll invite me out if I, for some reason, I'm able to get away. Happy. He'll invite me, or he'll ask me if I don't mind <laughs> um, find, signing some cards, you know, you know, for the event, or if I don't mind my card being included in a set of of trading cards. And I say, yeah, that's that's fine. Oh yes, he's actually restarting the trading cards in April. That's pretty yeah. pretty amazing. Yeah, I, I, I he yeah. told me the 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 web website will will reopen on April first. He said. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. true. Yeah, <laughs> never know on April first whether someone's telling you the truth. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So let me ask you about the opinion. I mean, in the last five years, retro gaming was pretty much hyped. I mean, they released a movie, Wreck It Ralph. Um, they they made sequels of Street Fighter movies, which was also a classic game of the 80s and 90s. So, and right now a lot of companies are coming back from the ashes and re-release and movies, as we said. So, what's your opinion about this retro move, going back to games from the 80s and 90s? Do you? Do you yeah. welcome that? What's your opinion about that? That trend? Yeah, I think it's great. Every everything seems to kind of go in cycles with clothing or styles of things. So it's natural that you have interest back to when all these the genesis of video games. So I think it's cool. You know, we'll have maybe a and then it will kind of be forgotten for a little time, and maybe years down the road there'll be another kind of renaissance with with the old games again so i think it's cool to get some you know kind of attention back to the the very beginnings of these games that people have just known ever since they were born video games were were part of their life 
but back when we grew up, we remember the the onset of video games, going back to the first games like Pong. I remember like revolutionary. So that's good to have some of these the the newer game gamers get exposure to these old games. I see. Yeah. What are you actually you plan for the future? Besides promoting and hanging out on events, what's your plans? Um, try to get my kids to uh, college. <laughs> They've grown up since the film. My son's going to be a sophomore at 10th grade, and my daughter graduates from high school this year. She'll be off to college. And so we've got kids moving out of the house, and that's going to be a change in our family dynamic. So that'll be... That's the first goal is to get my kids off to college and make sure they're taken care of and, um, you know, get them set so they can have a good career in whatever they choose. As far as gaming, um, I don't, right now it still just comes down to these Kong offs that come off, come up every year or so, or the goal is to get them to be an annual event, um, you know, and just still um, give thanks to the game that got me to to where I am as far as you know getting chances to to be in movies and and things like that. So I I do want to keep paying back the video game community whatever way I can. So I'll just go to events and 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 things like that for now. And and that's as far as that's as far as I um, see it happening in the near future with the gaming. Well, thanks for taking the time. It was a pleasure talking to yeah. you. Right? Yeah. All thanks, right. Jordan. Yeah, All right. thank you. Bye.